Broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. All right, welcome back for another episode of the Freight 360 Podcast. Ben, I was thinking about it. I feel like the our intro I feel like half the time it's not correct because I'm not always in Orchard Park. I'm in Rochester, New York this week, um, and next week I'll be in Nashville. So we're going to have incorrect uh, intros for episode 182 and 183. Uh, But this is a great episode. We love having guests on, and we've got Jeff from Blue Book with us today. We'll get to Jeff in just a second. But first, if you are brand new here, thanks for joining us on this great episode of Freight 360. If been here for a while. Make sure you're checking out all the other content. Continue to send us your questions and share us with your friends in the industry. This episode is brought to you by Blue Book Services. Blue Book is the resource you need if you're transporting fresh produce. Their online database contains thousands of companies throughout the produce industry supply chain. You can easily search their database to generate new sales leads. Blue Book's credit ratings help you avoid companies with high credit risk, and their team can help to resolve disputed loads. To learn more, Go to ProduceBlueBook.com and click join today. That's ProduceBlueBook.com. And who better to have with us today than Jeff from Blue Book Services. So Jeff, welcome to the show. I know you haven't been on yet. We've known you for almost a year now. Um, Just go ahead and for those who aren't familiar with you, just let us know what you do at Blue Book and how you got in the industry and kind of, you know, how things are going. Sure. It's great to be with both you, Nate and Benjamin and Freight 360 podcast, YouTube video today. Um, We're going to be talking about commodities and shipping those. And I've been with Blue Book Services now for over 25 years and uh, have really enjoyed working in the fresh fruit and vegetable industry this whole time with Blue Book. Um, Currently in the role of marketing director here, overseeing all of our our corporate marketing, branding, um, as well as Got my hat on at different times during the week for some sales opportunities, business development, and uh, service opportunities. So we really are just grateful that we can serve the fresh fruit and vegetable industry. This is our 122nd year serving the industry. Wow. We've been we've been in business since 1901. Um, so it's it's just a pleasure to be able to serve the industry with business information that listeners like yours can use to make new connections, grow sales, manage business risk, and really in, in the transportation of fresh fruits and vegetables, use Blue Book Services information to do business right. So it's really good yeah. to be on with you guys today. Yeah, we're, we're excited to have you. So for all you young brokers out there who are looking to get into produce, open your ears for this episode because Jeff's been in the industry longer than some of you have been alive. You figure, you know, a lot a lot of these, uh, you get a lot of brokers that start first job out of college, they're 22, 23 years old. So um, this is going to be a good one. And we're going to have you on twice more li- throughout the year to go through some commodities. So kind of the the uh, the layout for these episodes, what we wanted to do is identify some commodities and look at where are they shipping out of currently. And then we try to zoom you know, we try to fast forward and zoom out and look at, you know, a couple months down the road, where will they be shipping out of? Because that's a great opportunity for prospecting uh, future business. So good stuff. Looking forward to it. Um, ben, how are you? I didn't give you a chance to say anything. Doing well, brother. Enjoying the sunshine and the warm weather. Good. Good stuff. Um, sports recap um don't have a whole lot although we were we were talking about this before we started today the and the golf world the is it the players is that what it was is coming up this week yeah yeah right now or actually the arnold palmer invitational finished i think yesterday and the player starts this weekend up at tbc okay. gotcha um I saw, actually, I did. I said I had nothing to say about sports, but I think this is one of the tournaments where last year it was won by somebody that was in, that went to live, live golf. So they're saying like there's, you know, there's a lot more opportunity this year for folks on the PGA Tour to to get some wins and get some purse money there because their competition is now playing over in the other league. 
So well, there's a lot in golf recently where I've seen some players come out publicly because of what they're rolling out on the PGA next year, which is a similar format to live, but with only like the top groups of players. And they're basically going to shrink the field by half. And it's almost like the same format from what I read, you know, three days, there's no cut. And basically most of the guys in the second half of the field are saying like the whole point of the PGA is to have the best golfers in the world complete on the best stages. And if you're going to eliminate half the field just to funnel more money to the top players so that they don't leave to go to live, it kind of defeats the whole purpose. And they're like, it's a little disingenuous to what they say they're representing when it's really more of a cash grab to funny funnel money to just the top players and not the whole rest of the sport. So I think the next few years are going to be wow. really interesting just seeing how all of this kind of plays out because it's definitely changing a lot. In fact, even last week's tournament, the Honda Classic, they've been playing that like in my neighborhood for I think 30 years. And this is the last year Honda is going to sponsor the tournament. Mainly because the purse is so small compared to the bigger tournaments and compared to live now that they're saying, you know, you know, in the 80s and the 90s and even the early 2000s, like the Honda was a big tournament. It was referenced by the sponsor. And back then, like that was a car that, you know, people were going to go and buy. And they're like, it's really not anymore. And not only that, but the purse isn't even nearly big enough and they don't think that, you know, sponsors like Honda or Honda absolutely said they're not going to match the $20 million purses at some of the other big tournaments. So it's yeah. definitely changing the landscape, changing the tournaments, changing the format of everything, just introducing all this money. So it is going to be interesting. They're just shaking Whatever things the up. Old, that they are. All right. Good stuff. Well, we got a good episode today. Let's give a shout out to our friends over at DAT. And then we're going to talk produce. Tired of struggling to find accurate rates and the right carriers for your freight? With DAT1, you can access more than 500 million posted loads in trucks every year. That's three times more capacity than any other load board. Plus, their integrated freight management system makes it easy to cover loads 24-7. They have the most trusted network of carriers, brokers, and shippers in the industry, and you'll get real-time rates on every lane so you know exactly how much a shipment will cost before you take it from your shipper. One of the other great things about that one too is lane makers. And I've been spending more time in that aspect of it. And it's a really cool product that basically allows you to search lanes by the carriers that have posted in the past or looked for loads in that lane. So a whole other way to find carriers and capacity in the market. So some really cool products coming out now with DAT1. Free link show notes for a free month in the show notes. I was kind of Almost lost that one, but <laughs> <laughs> all good. All right, let's talk produce today. So the two commodities that we are going to talk about are avocados and onions, and we'll dig into those in a second, but I kind of want to set the stage here. So if you're new to brokerage or if you're new to produce in general, there's some considerations and we've talked about them in other episodes, but there's considerations you have to think about when it comes to fresh produce versus a standard dry commodity, right? So some of the things are, um, they can be damaged easily. They can spoil. They tend to have to be controlled, the temperature controlled in a reefer unit, whether that's heated up in the winter time or cooled down in the warmer months of the year, like the summer. Um, and the where the commodity ships out of is going to move based on the season, right? So like in the middle of, uh, summer, you might be able to get a, a certain kind of produce out of the Northeast and you're definitely not getting that commodity out of the Northeast when it's January, right? Just because there's snow versus sunny and 75. So those are just some considerations to have. Um, we do tend to find produce does result in higher margin for brokers on average. And I think that comes down to the fact that there's a lot more that goes into it based on those considerations that I just said. Um, Whereas you might, you know, if you're moving, you know, basic steel or just lumber that's not really high damage potential, you get a lot of people that are just, they just want the cheapest rate. They don't care how quick it's got to go. Whereas with produce, it has a shelf life to it, right? You, you can't, a produce grower can't just sit there for two weeks with recently harvested onions or avocados and say, oh, I'll just wait to find a cheaper truck in a couple of days. It doesn't work that way. There's a, there is literally a lifespan on how long that produce can, um, you know, last before it gets spoiled from harvest until it's sold at a supermarket. 
Well, and that plays out too. That plays out in the quality of trucks you're able to put on these loads too, which also increases the margin, right? Like you're going to put a load that has to be there in a certain amount of days, or there's a high cost to that. You don't want that on a truck that's got an out of service percentage of 35%, right? Or 40%, right? You want a newer truck. You want a carrier that's got better equipment and a better vetted driver, making sure that this truck doesn't break down along the road. To your point, if you got a load of lumber and the guy breaks down and he sits on the side of the road for two or three days, or he's at a mechanic for three or four days, really not much is usually lost in that scenario in time or risk of the commodity. In produce, you could lose half a shipment or all of the shipment, right? It can be theoretically worthless by the time the truck gets fixed. So a lot of these things play out too, I think, in just what the cost needs to be, the risk and the margin that you can make for doing the work to get a truck for it. Yep. So Jeff, I want to start out, um, and we know we talked about this a little bit off air, but there's a training, is a is it a course for new employees that Blue Book offers where folks can learn about some different interests excuse me, intricacies. What does that look like? Do you know what it entails? Yeah. So we, pro- we provide as a service to Blue Book members, our customers, a new hire academy. Okay. And it's a, tra- it's a training video series that helps you, whether you're brand new to the fresh fruit and vegetable industry, or even have years of experience to brush up on some things you may have either not have received in some type of training format or may not be aware of at all. It's called the New Hire Academy. So it, it covers produce and transportation trading guidelines. So there's two separate videos on those topics. It also covers the Perishable Agricultural Commodities Act, Trust, um, which primarily is for both produce sellers and produce buyers and what, what that all involves. Um, there's also like a sales management training video to help people who are on, on the sales side of the of the supply chain. So those videos are available and, and that we have created and developed and, and you can watch them whenever you want. And you can even take a, a quiz after you complete watching all those videos to see how well you've retained what you've learned. Nice. So I think that a big takeaway, and I want to point this out, is that as as brokers, oftentimes we get stuck in this narrow mindset of all we have to know is the transportation side. But the reality is, if you don't understand the commodity, and in this case, the produce side of it, um, you're you're going to do yourself and your customer a disservice if you're not if you're not fully you know educated all around the spectrum. So I like that it has a lot of different. Um, aspects to what you know what those videos go through. So, uh, and mm-hmm. like we said in the in the ad reader earlier on, you can go to produceBlueBook.com to join and get an annual membership for Blue Book services. So um, definitely check that out. All right. So Ben, actually, I'm curious when you were when you went through training as a new broker, did you guys have any produce specific training, or was it just general freight? Ooh. We did. Or was it so long ago um, that you don't remember? <laughs> I do remember. We did have some produce training in it. Not likely as extensive as what Blue Book offers, but a lot of the basics, um, the terminology, what pulping a product means, what are the different types of reefer conditions for certain types of things. There were definitely some fundamentals in there, I think. But again, it was six, seven years ago now, so it's been some time for me to reference yeah. <laughs> specifics. We do. Um, we we move a, a good bit of fresh produce and I mean really refrigerated freight overall. So we ask anyone in our company to go through the the Food Safety Modernization Act training through the FDA. It's free, uh, very very short training, but it goes through you know basics of operating in a temperature controlled trailer and cleanliness and stuff like that. So. That's another good one that's out there. Let's get into some commodity stuff here. So um, we'll go with avocados first. So Jeff, um, what did you find for, let's talk about where it's shipping out of now. And to give you guys reference, you can access a lot of this information through the Know Your Commodity tool on the Produce Blue Book website. So check that out. But what do we find out for where avocados are shipping out of currently? And if you're listening to this in the future, it's March 2023 right now. Yeah. 
So, so, the, so the other thing too, just a couple little side notes on what you've already hit there, Nate. As far as you know, produce is a, is a whole different type of uh, commodity in transportation, meaning it's it's it, it's fresh. So, as you said, it has an expiration shelf. It has a shelf life, right? It has a season that that anyone who's transporting needs to be aware of. And then two, what when you're either brokering loads or transporting loads, what can you put together and what you, can you not put together, meaning a mixed load? Because if, if you mix a load with you know, one commodity that's ethylene sensitive and the other one gives off that ethylene gas, you could have that whole load turned to mush in a so, day. Can you give an example? Because I've had that happen I, in my kitchen and it's definitely like onions and something else that do that. Well, it's funny you said that because I picked up uh, clearly. I mean, I was reading the Know Your Commodity thing in preparation for this, and avocados clearly give off ethylene. And then later in there, it even says what they do to ripen avocados faster is artificially add ethylene to it. Mm -hmm. So clearly, avocados, right, are one of those, you know, produce commodities that give that off. So mm -hmm. there are other ones that basically it'll ripen the other one, I guess, quicker. Is that kind of what happens there for a layman? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, you, you always have that thing, like if you want to ripen one commodity, like for example, bananas, put put a tomato in a bag with a banana, it'll ripen it because there's gas that's being given off. Um, so yeah, you just need to know what commodities there are that, that are ethylene sensitive and which ones are not. And usually, um, the person that's loading that truck should know that well, mm -hmm. because if they don't, you're in, and and you and you start mixing loads, it's not going to be happy. And so, especially if things are giving off ethylene gas, and you know, like tomatoes, um, uh, bananas, you know, those are usually um, sometimes are picked not ripe, but they can be ripened with ethylene gas at the receiving end of wherever that product's being shipped to. Um, here's what I found. So I just, I figured out cause I, this has happened to me. I found, um, onions and potatoes are two that should not be stored or shipped together. And it says that because they produce a high amount of ethylene gas, it says the best example of this is if you store onions and potatoes together, um, it would see it'll, it'll, it'll hasten the ripening process on the potatoes leading to them to grow eyes and sometimes roots. Mm -hmm. And I've had that happen before where, yeah. you know, I've, I'm like, I, this is when I was probably first living on my own. And I was like, you know, buying whatever together. And I would store like, cause onions and potatoes, you could, you know, you're not putting them in the fridge. You store them on the counter, I'd like put them in a bowl. And next thing you know, it was like, just did not, did not go well. So I learned my lesson, but it, I didn't know I had to do with that gas. So that's good to know. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so I mean, everything too is in like broccoli gives. I mean, you got to keep in mind this is these are living, living fruits and vegetables. Organisms, they're mm -hmm. organisms, and so they respire. And some respire, res I think it's respire more than others. So like broccoli, if you put that in like a, a plastic bag, or you put bananas in a plastic bag for a period of time, they actually feel warm on on the top. So, and I do that and I was interested to see if as someone who's going to mention broccoli, because I take broccoli out of the bag that I get at Costco, put them in a Ziploc bag with a paper towel and you can absolutely smell the gas when you open it. And it absolutely is definitely warmer than the other vegetables that are in the crisper and like in that drawer. Yeah. So again, can you give us like an example? So, I mean, if you had this loaded with something else, you could theoretically end up at the receiver with just... Like, how does that play out? Then I guess that goes directly to the shipper or does that go? Yeah, I, I, I wish I had the answer to that question. I don't, but there's someone's responsible if they're going to be mixing yeah. loads. And, and, you know, depending on if I mean, not all trucks can be fully loaded with a specific commodity. So they're stopping at one uh, pickup point and then another and maybe a third. And so they may have three separate loads of various fruits or veg and they, they just need to know um and a are they compatible and then b what's the temps that they need to run at too because if there's different temps for all three that's not good either yeah. so these are all just different things you need to keep in mind you know I, I really as i've learned here over the years 
hauling, brokering produce loads. You either do it right or you don't do it all because of the margins, because of um, the perishability of the fruit, fruit or veg that you're hauling. And you just, it's, you just need to know these things, and, and you can. And so you know, we're doing this episode today, and I think it's, this is fantastic because we're hitting on some things that people need to know if they're going to be working with various commodities. Yeah, so another uh, on avocado, right? Think about how I th- avocado to me, and I'll compare them to onions. They're very time sensitive. Like think about you go to the grocery store and you're like, all right, do I want my avocados for today or are they from three days from now? Because if you know how they get, they go from like being hard to softer. And if mm-hmm. you want to make guacamole, you can't mm-hmm. be using a hard avocado. It's got to be soft enough that you can get it out of there and uh, be able to eat it that day. Whereas an onion... I've had onions that I've had for two weeks and they didn't, they didn't seem to go bad in my opinion. Whereas an avocado feels like within a week, it just changes its state from mm-hmm. hard to like basically gooey. So yeah. What I, where what are we, I, what I, what I, go, go ahead. I was going to say where well, we can go. I'll let you go first. And then I want to go into where they're shipping out of currently. Sure. So I mean with avocados, if I, if I remember what I read correctly about this, you know, in, in, California Avocado Commission is a tremendous resource to the produce industry um, and have a lot of just educational tools. But avocados don't actually start to ripen until after they're picked, like ripen completely. So that's what you see is you, as you see the change in color and, this, and the softness or the hardness in the avocado. Once you, get, once you buy it at the store, it's, it's continuing to ripen and there's a shelf life to it. But um. You know, avocados overall since the beginning of the year have been coming out of primarily out of Mexico. Um, they're coming up through both the border crossings in Nogales, Arizona, and and the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. But we're starting now to see that transition with the availability of avocados coming out of California, which is a, a major producer and grower shipper from that state, which is they're kicking off their season now in March. That'll run through December. And, and that you, you did remember correctly because in that article in know your commodity, it specifically said there is an, in, there's an inhibitor in the fruit stem that prevents avocados from actually ripening on the tree. Though mm-hmm. many would presume that when the fruit falls from the tree, it's mature. Maturity is generally determined by its weight and its oil content not by when it falls off the tree. Interesting. So I want to point something out too. So Jeff mentioned where, you know, that up until now, avocados have been coming up through Mexico into the border crossings on the southern border of the U.S. And that will be shifting to California starting around this month. The important, the reason I want to point this out, and this goes for every produce, every every commodity of produce that moves around, uh, if it's not full year round in a certain area, So, for example, if you are going to move avocado as one of your niches for a commodity, you need to understand where this stuff is shipping out of at different times of the year so you can line up where you're going to have customers located so you don't have a seasonal break for four months of doing nothing. And that's not your goal. But we had a guy uh, years ago that he did a lot of avocados that came up through Mexico throughout the uh, the first couple of months of the year because they weren't moving out of a lot of other parts of the States until the springtime. So, and then that business and his customer base shifted. So, and keep in mind, this is where it gets kind of complex. You're dealing with an existing customer that you're moving loads with while prospecting a future customer's business two months down the road, same commodity, but different locations. And they have different times of the year that they're going to be busy. And to add to that, what's really interesting, and we've talked about this with clients when we're showing them how to use this tool in Blue Book, but the varieties are very different. The Mexican versus the Californian versus the Florida avocado. And there's actually even two variants in Florida avocado. So being able to have a conversation about those differences with your prospect is what's going to help not just project, but get across or convey that you understand the commodity you're asking them to ship for them, right? And being able to understand even just the general differences, that the fat content's different, that the taste is different, that the hardiness is different, which means 
it's portability. It's ability to transport is different, right? Where Mexican are much hardier than Florida, which aren't as hardy as California. And just understanding that those are all a little bit different is going to help that prospect or that shipper understand that you've done your homework, you know, to Jeff's point that you've spent more than five minutes researching this commodity to understand it, understand what the risks are, and to be able to haul this with all of those things in consideration, I think. Yeah, another thing too, and this comes from the Know Your Commodity tool on producebluebook.com, you can see things such as the, uh, you know, we talked about the months where they'll be shipping out of certain regions, both domestic and um, outside of the U.S., but additionally, optimal transit temperatures. So for example, for avocado, we see it's 40 to 55 degrees. That's a, fairy, a fairly wide range. So I think it's this is a, a good time to point out that when you are shipping anything that's climate controlled, especially produce, you need to have a conversation with your customer, the shipper, to identify what they need that reefer unit set to. And keep in mind, like Jeff alluded to earlier, you can't just change the temperature and it's all of a sudden cooled down instantly. It can take hours, depending on the the outside temperature, for a reefer unit to reach the temperature it has to get to. So if you have a driver on their way to pick up and it's got to be set to 40 degrees, they need to turn that unit on well ahead of time. It needs to be 40 degrees inside that reefer by the time that they start loading. Not, hey, it'll get there in a couple hours down the road. That's where you're going to get set yourself up for, for a bunch of claims. And I think when we had Doug on um, recent or previously, he meant he hit big on that point too. So um, another good tool that is on the Know Your Commodity uh, portion of the Blue Book website is that optimum transit temperature. Additionally, make sure your bill of lading has that temperature written on it because that's a legal document that your carrier is going to see. I would say... T- tell your the driver over the phone, on the BOL, and um, on your rate confirmation. You, you cannot tell your driver too much what the proper temperature is. And also, is it on a cycling setting? Is it continuous? These are all things that you need to make sure you're talking over and over about so you can prevent issues from popping up down the road. So uh, do we have anything else on the avocado side before we talk onions? Well, yeah, just, I mean, I just – yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Just as far as – you know, how do I, how do I, as a broker or prospect for potential loads, you know, Blue Book Online gives you that ability to search specifically for companies that are, sh- that are shipping avocados. So and I did, did a little bit of a quick run through of what does our database provide? And there's over 250 companies that have a 3X or better rating that are shipping avocados. And that 3X or better rating, 1X is poor, 4X is excellent. It's based off of the, the company's trade practices. This is a, an average rating based on how they do business. Do they do what they say and say what they do? Um, and that's a rating that a company earns. It's not based on um, the quality of the, of the avocado or any other produce that they're buying and selling, but it's, it's a business practices rating. So again, there's over... 250 companies that have a 3X or better rating um, that we currently publish in Blue Book Online Database. And that database has over 10,000 companies in it serving the fresh produce supply chain. And just as far as a breakdown for states, uh, California has over 85 companies with a 3X or better rating. Texas, over 50. Florida, over 40. Arizona, coming in at 15. So, you know, this is just a great tool to use to not only know the seasonality and, and transportation of a respective commodity, but also where where do I find people that I could potentially haul for uh, or, or broker a load for uh, in those respective states? I'll add in there, Hawaii is listed on the on the website. Um, I yeah. I remember I once looked because I was like, ah, oh, you know, Hawaii has transportation needs. There was like at the time I looked, there was like eight registered freight brokerage companies in Hawaii. Um, there's not a whole, I mean, you got to figure the majority of freight brokers business in Hawaii would be, you know, short haul stuff for a small trucking company. But a lot of those, it's so small, you're going to have like, you know, probably direct contracts and, and mm-hmm. whatnot. But did I did not know that Hawaii was a grower of avocado until I learned from the Know Your Commodity tool. So yeah. fun little fact there. All right. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk onions. 
I feel like with mm-hmm. onions, as a consumer, people love them or hate them. I don't know anyone that's really indifferent on onions. People are like, I love them. They add flavor to my my cooking. And people that just absolutely hate them are allergic to them and anything else in that realm. Um, some of them make you cry. Some of them make your food taste good. Uh, but onions, where are they? Um, what do we know about where they're shipping out of currently? How does that how does that shift throughout yeah, the, in, you know, the next couple of months? Sure. Keep in mind, too, there's there's tearless onions. Is there really? Is that like a uh, – do they oh, do yeah. some kind of like genetic – like it's a variety. Uh, it's, a variety. Or? it's tear. It's tear, called tearless onions. Yeah, tearless. I think it's called tearless onions. Yeah, so, you know, I think I think people, too, need to just – general general – in generality, uh, people need to know about onions. Obviously, there's, there's variety of onions, just like there's variety of avocados. And some people gravitate more toward a, uh, I want to say it's pungent or really strong tasting onion. Other people like the sweet onions, so like Texas sweets. Or we're getting into Vidalia, Vidalia, Georgia onion season. So it's just a matter of, of what you've been able to come to in your respective store as well as just have you have you have you done a study on onionology uh what does that look like <laughs> what does that look like and uh know, know your onion just as much as as know your come on, know your uh your avocado so you know right now you know year round there's supply of on- onions come out of idaho california um new york state washington and oregon obviously some of those states aren't growing onions right now but they're they're either going into the ground or they're getting ready to go into the ground but um they have year-round availability um you know nevada has been rocking onions growing and then shipping since the beginning of this year through april which is next month and there's going to be a break for onions come out of nevada and then september through december they'll be kicking off another uh, seasonal deal and then Texas is kicking up their season right now in March, and which will run through through August. Um, as I mentioned, Vidalia, Georgia, they have a huge onion season coming up that's going to kick off here in April, run through September. Arizona's May and June. Um, and New Mexico is also a big onion growing, producing state, June through September. So those are, those are areas right now that uh, are either shipping or growing onions or both. And we, there's over 20 states here in the continental U.S. that grow, in, grow onions, which is pretty impressive. So I'm curious because I'm looking at the the uh, seasonal calendar myself. So it, it looks to me like there's a sweet spot for temperature to grow them because there's a gap in the summertime for like the Midwest, it mm-hmm. looks like. Um, so like Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan. Even North Dakota, Minnesota, Nevada have like a four, five month gap in the middle of the summer. What does that, what does that tell us? It's got to be, I guess I'm just, Ben, what do you read out of that? You'd think almost like yeah. the hot states would need to cool down, but I these are like so. cooler states then, that. Yeah. And then you see like even, and I guess it's probably the bigger states, but Georgia, right? You would think, you know, their season they're, they're, is They got them in summer. the hot middle of the summer. Yeah. yeah. April Maybe that's September. the type of, that's gotta be the type it's of onion. Be the type, yeah. It's gotta be the type of onion in the different regions, I would assume. Right. Yeah, that's Jeff? interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, something I want to point out on onions too. And if you've listened to us for a while, I've probably told stories like this, but Onions are one of the commodities that sometimes a uh, shipper, the way they do their pricing might be based on the weight. So they might do it per 50 pound bag or 100 100 pound crate or whatever. So they do it based on like, we'll give you a certain number of dollars and cents per bag that's loaded rather than an all inclusive flat rate. And the reason they do that is they know how much they need to spend or they know their profit based on each bag that gets sold to whoever they're selling their the onions to. And that's why they want to pay their transportation that way. So if they say, hey, we're going to pay you um, you know, $7 per bag that gets shipped and your max rate would be whatever if it loads to 40,000 pounds or 42,000 pounds, okay? If your customer is going to pay their freight bill that way, 
you need to make sure that your carrier that you're hauling, so that truck that's actually going to go get loaded up, they need to know that if they're not loaded to that full weight, that rate is going to be decreased based on the actual loaded amount. So an example of where I've seen this end up bad is where the carrier doesn't know that their rate is contingent on the number of bags of onions that get loaded. They just think, oh, I'm getting $6,000 to haul this X amount of miles. And then they only loaded to 39,000 pounds and they send an invoice in and they get short paid. And you know you might even invoice the customer too much because you didn't adjust the rate and it gets short paid. So you could end up in a situation where you may accidentally overpay a carrier, get short paid by a customer and take a loss on this commodity because of the way that the, the shipper wants to pay their freight bill. So in a perfect world, flat rates are great and they're desirable, but there are certain customers and I've seen them with onions more frequently than, you know, potatoes and onions both I've seen more frequently than other commodities where they will want to pay that freight bill based on how much product was actually loaded. So um, Jeff, was that something you were aware of or is that like kind of a common thing in produce where they want to pay? I mean, I know you're, you're more focused on the commodity and the produce world than the freight transportation side of it, but is that something that you've ever heard of before? Or is that new news? That's, that's new for me. Yeah. Good rule yeah. of thumb is whatever you're getting paid at, you want to mimic it on your pay side, right? If the customer's paying you at a certain variable rate, make sure you're doing the same thing with the carrier because it is a nightmare to try to convert them back, negotiate that, and to just deal with the headaches, as Nate pointed out, associated with it. Where carriers are like, well, I can't max that out. I'm good. I'm good. You know, send me on my way. And then all of a sudden, you know, they look back at their rate con and they get short paid. And then it's a nightmare to work backwards from there. Yeah, you got to communicate that for sure and make sure it's clearly listed on your rate confirmation. So um, the rate per bag is going to obviously change based on the mileage. So if it's going a longer distance, they're going to pay you more per bag. And if it's a shorter distance, they're going to pay you less per bag. Um, but you think about it, if you're talking like real a realistic situation that I've seen is $7 per bag of 50 pounds. So that's basically $14 per 100 pounds. And someone, they short loaded by like over, uh, it was like 2,500 pounds or something like that. So you're talking like hundreds of dollars. Yeah, it's like 400 um, bucks. Yeah. yeah. So th this is not some small little error where it's like, ah, it was 20 bucks. I'll just eat it. Like you could take a serious loss, especially if you're, if you're only, you know, you could break even or take a loss on it just because you didn't, you know, you, you didn't pay attention to the details when it comes to that. So, um, but agreed to what Ben said. You need to mimic the way you're being paid by your customer in the way that you pay your carrier. So if it's per hundred weight, per bag, or a flat rate, uh, I, I always say the same thing. If there's a fuel surcharge, I would do it identical so the carrier understands this is the fuel surcharge. So, uh, but yeah, um, good stuff. Anything else on onions that we want to hit on? Yeah, just as far as you know, what's what's the opportunity out there for for companies that are shipping onions. So there's over 600 companies that have a three extra better rating in Blue Book's database. California leads leads the pack with over 130 um, companies with a three extra better rating. Texas, 70. Idaho, 40, 40 plus. Washington State, over 40. New York State, over 25. Oregon, over 25. And we come into Georgia, um, just over 10. Arizona 15 and New Mexico 15. So, and there's what, two, four, six, eight, ten 10 states that, that are rocking it with onions for potential opportunities. And if you think about that, just these two commodities alone would give you enough leads with, you know, good credit, we're not necessarily credit rating, but business practice ratings where they're reputable companies. That's enough prospects for you to work on for two months. Just those two commodities alone, right? Mm -hmm. And if you went through all of those companies, you really should have a customer too at the end of that period. Yeah. I mean, if you're doing the things we're talking about, you're doing the things we talk about on this show, you're spending the time to do the research into these commodities. And again, not to the point where you're going to grow them, but you know them well enough that you can speak to them. You right? might realize you don't want to be a freight broker anymore. You want to be an onion or an avocado grower. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but again, if you're doing those things and you put these numbers up and you put the time in, there's really no reason why a month or two from now you don't have a few of these customers. Well, yeah. you, know, you look at you look at avocados and and depending on what the market rate is for an avocado, it's it's substantial. Um, they're not they're not called green gold for nothing, and uh, you know an eighteen wheeler rolling down the highway full of avocados. It's a lot of guac, and uh, you know it's like it's over a hundred thousand on a load. Yeah, yeah. a lot of money. And There's a great documentary if you haven't anyone looking for it. It's on Netflix, and one of the episodes is on avocados and just how much crime is involved in the growers because of what you just said it's so profitable that like cartels were getting involved in avocados because it's just so much money like their popularity has increased something like 10 or 20 fold in the past like even five and ten years they just keep getting more and more popular every year mm -hmm. well I will leave you with my thoughts on avocados. I don't like how Chipotle charges extra for guac, but you can go to Cadoba and That's it's all why. free. It's all included. It's my <laughs> thought. It's my take on it. Good stuff. Uh, yep. Well, we're going we're gonna to do some more commodities later in the year. We've got some listener Q&A to get to now. Um, but first, a shout out to our friends over at Lean, Lean Solutions Group. Looking to take your freight brokerage or agency to the next level? Look no, for, look no further than Lean Solutions Group. They are industry leaders in nearshore staffing for logistics companies with offices located in South America, Mexico, and the Philippines. They offer a wide range of exciting positions, including freight broker back office operations, accounting, tech and web development, business development, marketing, customer service, and more. Don't miss out on the opportunity to work with the best in the business. Visit their website at www.leangroup.com to learn more about the exciting solutions that they have to offer your freight brokerage or agency. All right. Our first, we've got two questions there. First question is, what are the monthly costs of running your own brokerage? Well, we can't really answer this across the board because every brokerage is different, right? If you do $100 million a year, you're going to have a lot different costs than someone who's just starting. So let's start with the start like if you're just going to open your own broker it's just you um some of the you know some of the common expenses that someone's going to have so think about your technology software type of um products right your tms we have you know we've got a couple of affiliate uh partner tms companies that have both um freemium versions to try them out and really good deals um, for the long term, so like Ascend TMS and Rose Rocket, check them out on our website or in the link in the show notes. And I've seen anywhere from like eighty bucks a month up to, you know, for large companies, they could you could be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, to buy these platforms. But figure um, less than a hundred bucks a month, you can get a TMS for for one person. Your load boards, so you can get a free month of DAT. Just use the link in the description as well. Um, but I would say probably software all in. You're probably at a couple hundred bucks, maybe 300 bucks a month, Ben. What do you think on that yeah, side of it? Yeah, free or 100 bucks for your TMS if there's one of you. Probably 200 bucks for your DAT load board. Maybe I would up that to their mid-level program. So you've got rate view and things. So maybe like 250. Then you've got your insurance because even though you're not required by the government, your customer is likely to require 100 million. Well, you need so. to have your surety bond. Surety bond, call that and five that's a, grand. That's an annual premium that's oftentimes day. paid on a monthly basis for certain folks. Based on your credit, you know, but we've seen anywhere from, you know, a couple grand up to 10 grand, I would say for the surety bond on a yearly basis, probably in the middle there. And then a phone system. I mean, you can use your cell phone. I recommend that you have a dedicated line to the business. You get one through Ring Central for 45 bucks a month. And then you should probably have Microsoft Office, maybe runs you another 50, 70 bucks a month. But I think you can buy that for the year for a couple hundred bucks. All told, with your computer, that covers pretty much your basics. Yeah. So, and I'll keep in mind here if you are looking to get into the industry, there are ways to try it off on the cheap before you fully commit. So, you can get the free month of a TMS, the free month of DAT for a load board. You can use Google sheets and Google yep. docs, right? Until you decide you want to get a Microsoft package. 
Um, you can use a Gmail account before you get a, an email domain. Um, you, you can't get out of having the surety bond. You're going to have to pay for that. Here's the thing I would say is one is if you think you'll know whether this industry is a fit after a month, don't spend any of the money because if you really want to see if the industry is a fit, sit down and see if you can make cold calls for a week or two in advance. If you can't do that, just literally finding shippers and calling them, that'll tell you everything you need to know. If you do yep. that and you feel this is still something you want to do, then start to spend some money because yep. the vast majority of the people that wash out, spend the money and then start to call and go, I really don't like this. Okay, well, you can find that out without spending the money. And you can certainly call shippers, whether or not you have a job, a brokerage, or even a company to work for. You can just call them and you can just call them as if you were a broker and just see if you're comfortable doing that. Yeah, call them, tell them you're writing a, a paper yeah. for college and you got to interview a bunch of uh, avocado and onion shippers. <laughs> Again, Good it's stuff. the act of calling that washes people out again. And I think yeah. you can figure that out without having to spend lots of money to your point. But I mean, either way, you're under a thousand bucks a month and that'll get you all, you know, very, very good products and insurance coverage and whatnot. So um, hopefully that helps. The next question we got is, this is a little controversial, Ben. What other load boards are out there besides DAT? <laughs> well, I DAT is a... a a strong partner of us at Freight 360. Um, we let's, we'll be honest, right? There's a lot of load boards out there. I think DAT clearly is the the biggest player. But I want to highlight there are some very niche load boards that DAT has no interest in competing in that space because that's not where their their market share of brokers and carriers is. So, for example, if you are hauling cars. There's a load board called Central Dispatch that is for auto hauling. That is their niche is where they focus on connecting brokers who have opportunities to ship cars and auto hauling transportation companies that have those specific car hauling trailers for their equipment type. So Central Dispatch is one of them. There's some smaller Select ones too for like general freight, like one, two, three load board. Obviously, yeah, truck post stop is, is another one. What's that? Uh, post everywhere is one post everywhere, yeah. used, used to go to every load board. Now I think it only goes to the smaller ones. Um, it it does. So like it never went to the big ones, but it did go to like one, two, three load board and yeah. um, some, of, but I th post everywhere, I believe has like 50 smaller load boards that it sends freight out to. So like bulk loads is on that list. Um, and I think it's pretty cheap. It's like 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. I think that, but it's again, it's it's not going to give you everything you need. Um, Selectus, I've mentioned them before. They're really big in the hot shot and smaller trailer equipment size type of freight. So your your box trucks, bread trucks, um, van like Sprinter van style stuff for just a couple of pallets. That, that's very common in the expedited world that freight forwarders um, and other three PLs will use. I'm trying to think any other niche little load boards that are out there. Oh, here's one. I can't just a general type. A lot of large brokerages have their own internal load boards that carriers will yep. use. So like CH Robinson, TQL, um, you know, you name it, right? There, there's uh load boards that are specific and centric to a brokerage based on the freight that they have internally. So uh, there's a bunch of them out there. People use Facebook as a load board. Now our, our Facebook group, has like almost 70,000 members in it and people are posting available trucks looking for loads and available loads looking for trucks. And um, yeah, I mean, hey, think outside of the box. You can't just put all your eggs in one basket. You got to diversify your your options and your sourcing. Yep. So, good stuff. Well, cool. Good questions. Make sure you keep sending them our way. We'll continue to answer them. Um, we, we do get some repeat questions fairly common and we don't always include them in the show like for example how do i find shippers we have got plenty of content on that just go to protusbluebook.com and join today that there's your uh list of shippers if you want to go the protus go. route so, um jeff it's great to have you on here today we'll have you again like i said a couple more times this year we're also going to have um doug come back on for another episode with us this year and we'll get into some lumber stuff with the lumber blue book uh, a couple times this year as well. So two different companies and entities, but 
um, under the same parent umbrella of Blue Book Services, if I'm correct. Yep. Is that is that how it's separated? Same company, two different services. Okay. That's a better way to put it. So like the uh, the produce Blue Book doesn't give you lumber information, and the lumber Blue Book doesn't give you produce information. It would be two two separate products under the umbrella. Cor- of correct. Company. Correct. And you can, sub- you can subscribe to both of those. So yeah, one's business information for the fresh fruit and vegetable industry. The other is uh, business information for the wholesale lumber industry. Nice. Business Very information cool. you can trust. Well, I mean, I would definitely say, and th- like I've been in the, the transportation industry for a little over a decade now. And when it came to, so I didn't even know about the lumber side, but for produce, 100%, that was always the go-to that I knew of when it comes to, hey, if I need credit information or just information on produce, I didn't know of anybody else besides um, Blue Book. And I'm not going to ask you who your competitors are because even if they, even if there are any out there, they're probably not really as relevant because you guys have been around, like you said, since 1901. Um, it's kind of hard to to beat a over century old company based on the amount of knowledge and information and um, reach that you guys have. So anyway, great to have you on again. Look forward to another episode. Do you have anything else you want to wrap up with here, Jeff? No, just good time with both of you. Grateful we could be be together here for this episode. You know, if you need anything, please feel reach reach out to me or produceBlueBook.com for for anything you need. Awesome, Ben. Any final thoughts? Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next time, go Bills. That wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode. And make sure to visit us online at Freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. And if you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the Contact Us form on our site and we'll see you next week.